Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, you know, I used to, used to, a lot of people add up the number of years they have. But by the way, thank you, Oscar, for that uh, nice presentation. But when when I heard 50 years, I went, you know, as you get older, that isn't that isn't as warm and fuzzy as it used to be. I'm like, Dad, gum, I'm getting old. So, um, well, we're, Brent and I are here to talk a little bit uh, as. Uh, has brought up us, um, our, what we do is basically build businesses and, and grow executives. But uh, I want to talk a little bit more about kind of why we do what we do. So we're going we're to talk about virtues and why it matters and things like that. But before we do that, I just want to talk about the why and why that matters. Um, so a lot of you are in organization, all of you are in some kind of an organization. And it's important that you understand not what you do and how you do it. I mean, that's part of it. But at the core, you have to understand why you do something. Um, uh, Brent and I had an executive recently. He was CEO of a company. I have about 15, 1,600 employees, uh, not, not from Oklahoma City, from outside of Oklahoma City area. And so just in chatting with him, and I, I asked him, I said, why do you do what you do? And he looked at me a little dumbfounded and said, um, Make money? I was like, no, because I've seen your financials, and that's not <laughs> why you're doing what you do. You, um, in fact, you would be better off selling your company and invest, you know, just investing it, and you'd be making more money than you're making right now. So that's not it. And uh, he says, well, then maybe I just don't know. I said, well, go away and come back. And uh, by the way, this gentleman was a third generation uh, CEO of a company. So he, his grandfather started it. He was probably, he's probably about 50. Uh, but he had never really achieved the respect of the team right around him. Uh, they viewed him as the grandson or the son and little silver spoonish probably. And so he went away and he came back and we were at a team meeting with his leadership team and him. And he got up and he says, well, he says, I've been asked to talk about why we do what I do. And he gave it some thought. And really what he came back with was he realized he was there not for the money, that he was there for the team right around him, for their families. He was there because he wanted to make sure this uh, legacy of his grandfather continued on. And he went on with a few really important attributes of why he did what he did. And I will tell you, in that instant, he gained the respect of that team around him. Instead of worrying about, we're here to make money, how are we doing this quarter, how are we doing that quarter, it became, and it was almost unbelievable how, and by the way, he wept as he said this. It was so deep within him, because he, for the first time, he had discovered why he did what he did. And so I would encourage you, uh, if you don't understand the why behind your business, that you do that. That's how great organizations are really built. So we're going to talk about a few virtues uh, today, and we're going to do it very casually. Uh, so um, uh, we, we may mess up a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, Shannon set the stage right, so occasionally the, the slide might not work perfect, so just bear with us. But we're going to share with you as best we can uh, some of the virtues and hopefully a few unique uh, perspectives. So I'm going to turn it over to Brent, and uh, we're just going to dive into this. All right. Thanks, David. You can keep that. Thanks, David. I'll move over here. Maybe I can get the, there it goes. So I want to go back to why it matters for just a minute. So uh, I actually started my career, I haven't always done this, I've been with Giant for a few years now, but I actually started my career as an engineer, okay? So as an engineer, I ask why an awful lot, but it was really more focused on sort of the technical aspects of why. Right? Why does this work this way and those sorts of things. And to be perfectly honest, as I began sort of my leadership journey and moved up into the executive ranks, I, I probably put less emphasis on executive leadership and just leadership in general in terms of growing organizations and those sorts of things than I, than I do now. Uh, I, was, I was deceived a little bit in that when I would look at growing companies, I would look at things like processes and equipment and machines and those kinds of things. And what I found over the years is that the most important thing you can do to grow your organization is grow the executives within your organization. Now, for those of you that are like me and are engineers and sort of need to know the answer to that question, why, uh, there was some great research that was recently done, uh, published in November of 2012 in Inc. Magazine, talking about the cost of bad bosses. And so, just some of the tidbits there. Three out of every four employees surveyed reported that their boss was the most stressful part of their job. 
Now, one thing I should mention to you, if you happen to be here today with your boss, <laughs> be really careful about your body language, okay? <laughs> no nodding, anything like that. Just be, very, just be very still for the next two or three slides, okay? 50% of those employees that don't feel valued by their boss were planning to look for a job the next year, okay? This statistic amazed me. Um, they, they, they estimated that bad bosses cost the economy $360 billion in lost productivity every year. Now that's a big number, okay? Apple's revenues are about $180 billion. Uh, I was looking up, there's about 200 countries on the globe. How many of them do you think have a GDP greater than $360 billion? There's about 30 of them, okay? So 170 countries have GDPs that are less than what the, what the economy loses every year because of bad bosses. And that's because of lost productivity, those sorts of things. But in my mind, the most telling statistic, and one we should all take to heart, 65% of employees surveyed said they would rather have a new boss than a pay raise, okay? So I want you to think about that for a minute, what they're saying. What they're saying is that they would actually pay the company to fix their boss, okay? <laughs> Now, this is where, you know, we're going to talk about virtues here in a minute, this virtue of being able to look inside and be self-aware. That's probably going to be hard for some executives to hear, but that's why I say, you know, most, most executive issues, most employee issues, we, we always have to start with the leadership. We always have to start with the leadership. And so David and I, over the years, we've gotten to work with lots of companies and lots of executives, and we, we coach a lot of them. And what we found is that there are some common threads among those executives that we look at and say, these are, these are just really great, high-performing executives, okay? And the term master executive, anybody ever watch uh, Norm Abrams and who was the other guy, Bob Vila, the New Yankee Workshop, those guys? They, those are, they're master carpenters. My grandfather was a master carpenter, and so uh, he died when I was very young, but I remember hearing about him from my father, and what my father said is there was a very specific process that he would use to become a master executive that he first had to apprentice, okay? He had to, he had to attach himself to, to some other master carpenter, and that was just all about learning the basics of how to do the job. Once he got the basics down, he became what was called a journeyman, okay? And the journeyman literally journeyed around, did, he did carpentry jobs and, and learned more stuff, learned more skills. But the key thing about being a journeyman that really stuck with me is that part of that was putting extra tools and putting new tools in his toolbox. So, I grew up in a house where calling the repairman was sort of, my dad was an engineer, so we never called the repairman, and my dad drilled into me from an early age, 80 to 90% of any job is having the right tools, right? And so, as a master, uh, to gain a master carpenter, it's important that you put the right tools in your toolbox and have that. And then as, a, as he became a master carpenter, literally, he would just go do bigger and more complex jobs. There wasn't anything he couldn't tackle. And so if you think about that, that same analogy can apply to executives, okay? We've all been around executives that just have a great toolbox, all right? These are the executives that can lead, they can get stuff done, um, they do it without creating a whole lot of stress, they communicate in a way that casts a great vision and inspire, and probably the best virtue is if any of you have ever, have ever been around an executive that you say, I would love to work for that person. Uh, that's a person I can, I can you know, learn something from. Uh, that's, that's probably the truest definition of a master executive. It's someone that others really want to follow. And so what we've done, based on our experience, is, is we found there's some common threads running among all those master executive folks in terms of virtues. And what we're gonna do now is talk about the virtues of a master executive. Now we've got 10 listed up here. I can almost guarantee you there's more than 10, but we only had time for 10 today. Uh, and we're gonna try and get to all of them if we can. And David's gonna chat about the first one, which is a healthy wake. Yes, yeah, so a healthy wake. Uh, I want you to think for a second about yourself uh, and or maybe somebody on your team and think in terms of the wake that they have behind them. Meaning, uh, think about when you walk into a meeting when you walk into a meeting, do people go, oh no, stress just walked in? Or an oh no, uh, oh goody, calm just walked in, right? So there's several sides to awake. Uh, one side of it is the results that you achieve. Okay, so in any organization, you have to achieve some results. Uh, that could be numbers, that could be any kind of things that you, how you measure your success. So results are obviously important. 
We've all seen those people that are really great at getting results, but they leave dead bodies in their wake, right? <laughs> so the other side of the wake is actually the people side. And you want to have equal between results and people. So you've also met people that are really great with people, but they get no results, right? They're just so nice. We can't get rid of them. They're just so nice, right? So we've had both sides of that. And by the way, you've also had, we can't get rid of them. They keep getting all the results, okay? The point is, great executives learn how to have that balance between both. There's a, a, a one, one, one way to think about that, even, and that's as a person. As a culture, you need the same thing. You need your organization to be balanced between people and results. Another way to think about that is being balanced between support and challenge. Okay, so challenge is actually exciting. That's not a negative thing. You want to challenge people to achieve results, actually create a little bit of that tension, like we can do this, we can do this, let's make it happen. Um, support, you have to be careful. If you're too far over to the support side, you know, I've seen that in, in certain businesses where Uncle Joe, right, maybe in a family business, Uncle Joe, yeah, he's a little bit of a nut job, but you know, he's part of the family, so we're going to keep him on board. That's, that's support going too far to one side. So the point is you want to have this nice balance between support and challenge, uh, and you need to have, even as a leader, that that nice wake behind you around um, your just how you treat people and getting results. The last thing I'll leave with you before I turn it back over to Brent to talk about the next one is this idea of teamwork. Now everybody's heard that activities should take, should trump, or excuse me, results should always trump activities. And you've seen that where people get really busy. Yeah, well I did what I was supposed to do. Yeah, but you didn't get any result, right? So they get more enamored with the activities they're involved in. So the saying is activity, or excuse me, results always trumps activity. Results trumps activity. The other one that most people don't get, and they sort of at first take a, a, a second look at it, is to say that teamwork trumps result. Now the reason I say that is because that, I'm telling you, if you run a business that's trying to make quarterly earnings or anything like that, that one is not intuitive. And what I mean by that is, if you have an organization that results always trumps teamwork, that's where you're going to have a lot of silos, you're going to have a lot of infighting, you're going to have a lot of that stuff. So people will actually try to, like, I don't care about you, I've got to get this done by Friday. Well, the problem is we have to work together next Monday. And so over the long haul, uh, I will tell you, teamwork should always trump results. Now, that doesn't mean we don't expect results, but as a, as a leader, one of the virtues you've got to have is understanding that we've got to make sure that teamwork is trumping results because in the long run we'll always win. Okay, second virtue I want to talk about is this idea of resiliency and we intentionally put this right after the wake discussion because I, I want to go back to that sort of boat analogy, right? So, and a boat, I got into sailing a few years ago and don't get to do it nearly as much as I, as I, as I want to anymore. But I bought a boat that was suitable for Lake Hefner, okay? I had an opportunity to go and spend some time on a blue water sailboat where you gotta understand, you know, Lake Hefner, the waves get to be about this high. Out on blue water, the waves, waves can get to be really, really high, right? So it, the, the whole of that boat, and you talked about your wake, the whole of that boat, think about that as your character for a minute, right? So my boat was perfectly suitable for waves that were this high. There was no way in the world I would take my sailboat out on the blue ocean because it's just not, it's not built enough, it's not resilient enough to stand that kind of pressure. And so when you think about the sort of the character of a master executive, um, that's really sort of the makeup of your hull and your boat. And so here's the way I want you to think of it. If you're doing things right as a leader, what happens to you, right? You get more responsibility, you move up, and those sorts of things. If you're doing it right, the, your, your, the waves you have to deal with, they're not going to get smaller, they're going to get bigger, okay? You're going to be called on to have more responsibilities. There, there's going to be more weight that is placed on top of you. And, and true master executives know how to handle that. So we've been around people before that when they're faced with that extra weight, whether that's a, a difficult employee, a downward economy, whatever it is, they kind of want to sort of pull the covers over their head and, and run away and hide and those kinds of things. And that's just not the right way to approach it, right? Great executives um, have a mindset that I'm going to call the strength mindset, okay? 
Now, psychologists look and they tell us, uh, one of the best ways I've ever heard to explain this, is people look at themselves in one of two different ways. And, and they look at themselves in terms of a, a strength or height, okay? So if I think of my height, I'm about six foot tall, I could work out all day long, I could do stretches, and I could maybe get my height to you know, six feet one quarter or something. But literally, there's not that much I can do to affect my height. So I've got two small boys. Um, when we would take them to Six Flags or to Disneyland or something like that, you know they, how they always had, the, had the, little, the little bar that when my kids were little, you had to, if you don't measure up here, you can't ride on this ride. And my youngest one, Philip was always leaving crying because older brother was, you know, where he could kind of pass over the bar and the younger one couldn't. People that have that height mentality, life is like a series of those, do I measure up or not, right? Do I measure up or not? And if you view yourself that way, challenges that you don't think you can sort of measure up to, um, you're just gonna kind of stick your head down and, and you're just gonna run away. The strength mentality is very different though, right? So what happens if I go to the gym and start working out and lifting weights? I, I get stronger, right? In fact, the way you get stronger is you lift heavier and heavier weights. So great executives have that strength mindset that they say, even though we're encountering these problems as a team, I know we can figure this out. And the other thing I will tell you, um, we've all heard of post-traumatic stress. There's actually a documented condition called post-traumatic growth. I can tell you through my experience as, as uh, uh, leading, uh, leading companies and organizations, I ran a startup one time that uh, after two years, the startup dived and just you know, ended up, had to shut the doors, went bankrupt. I will tell you that was probably the most difficult two years of my life. I would never choose to go back and repeat that experience again. But I will also tell you, I learned more about how to run a business, how to be a leader, and those sorts of things during that terrible, terrible time, during all that pain, I learned more going through that than I had learned in all of my successes previously. So even though it's sometimes you know, painful to go through, um, resiliency means I'm gonna approach this problem with a strength mindset, and even though it's gonna, hard to, 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 it's gonna be hard to get through, I know that at the end of that, it's gonna be like I've just been to the gym, right? I'm gonna be stronger and a better leader as a result of that, and master executives get that and have that, have that resiliency that they can view it that way. Okay, those are three very confident people in that, on that slide, right? They're all James Bond, but it's three very confident people. What I've learned over the years, there is a fine line between confident and cocky, okay? And the difference is humility, all right? So when I see people in a tux uh, and I think of a leader, all right, a lot of leaders think, oh, my job is to be the biggest person in the room, talk the loudest, be the one that's sort of at the center of the stage. And, and I think a tuxedo sort of reeks of that from a visual standpoint. What, I'd, what I'm a big believer in, though, is you can have that tux on, but it needs to look more like this, right? <laughs> and that is, I'm here to serve you. And a lot of leaders don't understand that. A lot of leaders think that their role uh, is to be the one having the answers. And I will tell you, when I find a leader that people will run through brick walls for, usually it's not the ones that have all the answers. The ones that have a humility gene uh, that's very, very apparent. Um, one of the things about humility that you need to understand is that there are wise people and foolish people. So uh, a wise person, when you talk to them, number one, they're transparent. They, they, they will actually say, you know, I don't really know the answer. Or they'll say, you know, I really messed that up last week. All right? And you'll give them a little direction, and they'll take that direction, and they'll change their behavior. And by the way, you can, you can actually... Uh, if, for those of you that have bosses and supervisors, wise bosses actually take your input really well, right? Because they have that humble gene, that humility gene. Uh, bosses that lean on the, on more on the cocky side, right? When you give them input, they're shooting the messenger, right? They're the ones going, uh, you're, you're wrong, I'm right, and, they, and in fact, they'll sort of change the truth uh, so that they don't have to change their behavior. So this idea of humility is, little, is a lot around transparency. It's about understanding, hey, I'm human. In fact, I will tell you, you will trust me more if I'll tell you when I mess up. So if I tell you, hey, you know that thing I was working on last week? Yeah, really messed that up. 
you will actually trust me more because if you work, f if I work for you and I've told you I messed something up last week, then when I tell you, by the way, I knocked that deal out of the ballpark, you won't have to follow me around to prove that right or wrong because you know me and you know that when I mess up, I actually say it. So I actually can build trust by being humble, transparent, having that right heart and those kind of things. So just a little bit about humility. The goal is to serve. And we're going to talk about how to get your, for those of you that have supervisors, how to get your boss more to understand uh, what leading up to that boss really looks like. Just, just to echo on humility for a second, I told you I've got two sons. And for those of you that are parents in the audience, I mean, think about that from a parenting perspective. Would you rather have your kids come to you and say, Mom, Dad, I really messed this up? or sort of deny that there was ever a problem. As parents, we would all, uh, you know, I would praise my kids for coming that, and I'll guarantee you, you know, depending on how bad it was, the punishment would be a lot less if they sort of owned up to the problem, right? And I'm gonna trust them more going forward. Um, so the next one we wanna talk about is this idea of courage. Now, Oscar talked a little bit about the virtue of courage starting out, and what I'm not talking about here is physical courage, although I will say, if you're a member of the military, the armed services, you know, police, fire department, and, and courage for you means literally you're gonna potentially put your life on the line, we, we praise you and applaud you and thank you for that. But most executives, uh, you know, you're, leading for you doesn't mean I, my life is at risk, right? For most of, most of us executives, it doesn't mean that. Um, but courage is still very important. That moral courage is still critically important. And so when I think of courage, I think of courage in two ways. And the first way I think of it is the courage to face reality, okay? Um, we are, as humans, sort of naturally wired to hate loss. In fact, there have been studies that have done, uh, been done. For example, if you think about uh, Thunder playoff tickets, and we are gonna make the playoffs, by the way, okay? <laughs> We're gonna make the playoffs. If you think of Thunder playoff tickets, and they've actually duplicated these experiments in several ways, um, you may say, I'm willing to pay $500, or I may, I'm willing to pay $1,000 to acquire a set of Thunder playoff tickets, okay? After you have those tickets, what the research shows is that there's no way you would sell those for that same amount of money that you paid for them, okay? You're gonna value them much higher once you have them. And typically it's anywhere from a 20 to 50% 20 to sort of premium you price on those actually having, having owned those, right? And so this is why when I say courage to face reality, we've all been in those situations as executives that we've hired the wrong person, right? We've pursued the wrong strategy, whatever. And yet this idea of I can't, I can't give up on that person or I can't give up on that idea or that strategy or that business or whatever, we're, we're all sort of naturally wired to be hoarders a little bit and we, we hang on to that. And so facing reality means how do, I, how do I sort of get outside myself and get a little bit of an outside perspective on that, okay? And, and if you just look in the, in the business world, the, the, the examples of this are rife. Think about back in 2008 when the car companies were going through, you know, went to the US government to ask for a bailout. It took a bankruptcy judge to tell Chevrolet that Pontiac had been losing money for 40 years and you needed, to, you needed to get rid of Pontiac, right? And these are incredibly smart business people, but they were tied in, we can't, you know, they were hoarding that, I can't, I can't give it up. It took that outside perspective. Um, Intel, when Intel first started, um, their big deal was memory chips. They actually didn't start as a company that made microprocessors, they made memory chips. And there was a point in time in the life of the company that the Japanese had really started coming on and were just kicking, kicking Intel's rear end in the memory chip market. And so they were struggling, the two guys were sitting there struggling with what do I do, what do I do? Do we get out of this business? Do we stay in this business? And what they did is they finally asked themselves the question, okay, if someone bought the company, if someone else came in, if we got fired, and someone else took over our job, what decision would they make? And they were able to pretty easily look at each other and say, um, yeah, they'd get out of this business. This is a, a no-brainer. This is a no-win no deal. And so Intel said, we're getting out of the memory chips business, and we've got this little thing called the microprocessor that we think might be a little bit of a big deal, so we're gonna, and we've got a pretty dominant position on that, so we're going to focus our business on that, right? But that wasn't an easy decision for them to make, right? It took the courage to face that reality. And a lot of times what can happen is leaders that we can sort of get that hope, and I will tell you, you've heard the phrase, hope is, is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy, right? Now, I'm not saying don't be optimistic and don't be hopeful, but hope is not a strategy. And there are times when hope is actually the worst thing you can do. If you're driving 50 miles an hour down a dead-end road, 
and you hope it leads somewhere, that's a very <laughs> dangerous thing, right? You don't necessarily want to do that. And so you've got to be able to have the courage to face that reality. The second thing I will say about courage is that it requires you to sometimes do those things that are really difficult to do, which means have those difficult conversations with bosses, employees, coworkers, whatever that is, and that's an incredibly hard thing to do. I can't tell you, we probably spend more time on that particular issue with executives that we coach than, than anything else, to provide that outside perspective, to get them to sort of face reality and say, you need to go have that conversation with them. And they'll always look at us and say, well, can you have that conversation? We say, no, you need to go have that conversation. But that's an incredibly powerful thing. And so David talked about this idea of serving. Um, and let me tell you, you can't serve your employees, you can't serve them if you're not willing to have a difficult conversation with them, okay? How many of you are parents in the room? I mentioned earlier, raise your hand if you're a parent of a kid. How many of you have ever taken your kid to the dentist? How many of you have kids that absolutely love the dentist and want to go? Okay, you got a few sort of oddballs out there, I'm just gonna say it. <laughs> if, there's, if there's dentist in the room, I apologize, but I do not like going to the dentist. My kids didn't, go, didn't like to go to the dentist. But as a parent, would I have been serving them if I told them, okay, you never have to go to the dentist, it's okay? No, I wouldn't have been. I mean, I'd, you guys would look at me and say, you're a terrible parent for not doing that, even though I knew that was going to hurt them. So courage sometimes means recognizing that as a leader, you may have to hurt someone. Now, we never want to intentionally harm someone, but sometimes we may have to say things to people that, that they're not going to want to hear. It may hurt their feelings to hear that, but ultimately, it's not serving them if you don't, if you don't tell them the truth, if you don't let them know where they stand, right? I, I've had situations where I've had employees that hadn't been told the truth, and they look at me when I finally do tell them the truth as a, as a new manager, uh, tell them the truth, and they say, man, I wish someone had told me that 10 or 15 years ago. And if you don't do that, you're really kind of stealing from them in, in one way, and we never want to do that. So master executives have the courage to face reality and to also have those difficult conversations when appropriate, okay? Because you can't serve people without doing that. So kind of a good segue between courage and focus. Uh, they actually have some similar attributes. So let me talk about focus in terms of your organization. Um, how many of you are familiar with Jack Welch who ran GE for a long, long time? So Jack Welch, when he got a hold of GE, they had roughly like 50 business units and they were doing about $25 billion in top line revenues. So 50 business units, $25 billion. Over the next 10 years or so, he actually got the organization more focused, meaning he went from 50 business units down to about 14 business units. The organization grew from about 25 billion to 125 billion during that same time because we got more focus. So everybody that was inside the organization knew, had great clarity about what they're about, what they were supposed to do. Now, all of us are, as Brent pointed out, great hoarders. We don't like getting rid of things. In fact, we love saying yes to things. I want you to think in terms of three categories as an organization. What you say yes to, what you say no to, and a middle ground is we'll just call the maybe zone. All right, now, organizations that don't understand how to focus, they'll have pretty cl good clarity around what we'll say yes to, fairly good clarity around what we'll say no to, but they have a very, very large maybe zone. And what that looks like is, well, that's an interesting idea. Let's have 12 meetings to talk about that <laughs> to decide if we want to do that or not, right? So it's a lot of wallowing, and really what the wallowing is about is trying to push that to a yes or to a no. That's one type of company that lacks focus. The other type of organization is one that just, they have a gargantua yes zone. We just say yes to everything. Like, about the only criteria is, do you think we could make money on that? Yeah, I think we could. Well, let's try that, all right? And next thing you know, about nine months down the road, I don't know why, it's usually about nine months a year, it'll be water cooler chat. Somebody go, why are we doing that? We have no business at all doing whatever that was, all right? That's people that didn't have great clarity around how to say no. If you want to really be a great leader inside your organization or have your organization be a great organization, learn the skill of saying no. You will grow faster, grow farther, learning the skill of no more than you'll learn from the skill of just saying yes to things. 
It takes courage. Uh, you know, I encourage people, even on a small scale, to have stop doing meetings. I love a two hour stop doing meeting. And that is, we're gonna walk out of this meeting and we're gonna stop a product, we're gonna stop a process, we're gonna stop a report, we're gonna do something that we know that if we get rid of it, probably nothing bad will happen, okay? And by the way, getting rid of products or services or offerings that might, you might do, here's how that works. So you'll, you'll look at something and you go, yeah, that, we're, it's kind of marginal, what would the return on investment we get out of that or whatever it might be. And as soon as you try to pluck it away, it's like that, that show Hoarders. <laughs> Remember Hoarders? They'd have these terrible houses filled to the rim with stuff. And then, and then you go, okay, we're gonna start taking stuff away from them. And they'd literally just pick up a, a piece of trash and go, can we take this? Oh no, no, don't take that, right? They just get very emotional about it. Same thing happens, you, you have to admit it, inside organizations. Let's go ahead and take that product out of the product. Oh no, uh, Bill, that customer from New York really loves that, we can't get rid of that, right? So we're, we're emotionally tied to all this stuff. You get emotionally tied to reports. I like seeing that report. I want to have that report. But have a stop doing meeting. That's the beginning of learning how to become more and more focused. It takes courage, but you can, you can absolutely do that. Brent? Okay. So the next virtue is, and I'll be honest, I, this is, we've maybe stretched this one to be a virtue, but this virtue of being able to manage stress. Okay. Now, how many of you raise your hands if you think stress is bad? Okay, all right, stress is bad. It's a pretty universal thought that stress is bad, but I will, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna argue with you for just a moment and say that not all stress is necessarily bad, okay? So um, if you're walking across the street and a truck starts coming your way and you're in the intersection, that's a pretty stressful moment, right? But that stress is sort of that stress that says, it's hyper-focusing, right? The, the adrenaline starts pumping, your, your, your upper brain sort of, excuse me, upper brain shuts down and your, your fight or flight reflex kicks in, blood pumps to the, to the muscles in your legs and you get the heck out of the way, right? That's really good stress if you think about it, right? Because it saves your life. I will also tell you, I get up and speak a lot and, and I always get nervous every time I get up and speak, right? There, it's, it's a little bit stressful being up here having, you know, a hundred something people looking at you. But I will also tell you that stress, I'm not thinking about anything else that's going on at work, right? I'm very focused right now. So there's a part of stress that, that is really very powerful, okay? There is absolutely a flip side to that. Lots of studies on stress is bad for your heart, hypertension, all those sorts of things, heart rate variability, which is a way that you, you measure the body's ability to respond to stress, all goes down when you're under conditions of extreme stress. I'll tell you the most significant statistic I heard, Princeton University just finished up a study about a year and a half ago where they looked at the effect of stress on IQ. And it was amazing what they found. What they found was that when you're under conditions of significant stress, your IQ can drop by about 40%, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but if IQ, and I'm not very smart anyway, <laughs> it, if, my IQ, I, if my IQ dropped by about 40%, I might not be able to find my way out of the house, right? <laughs> I certainly, certainly couldn't have made it here today. So, so that kind of stress, not only is it physically bad, it's mentally bad. Um, I used to work for a guy that managed, uh, his idea of managing stress was, he'd heard the phrase, never waste a good crisis. And so he saw that when, when organizations kind of go into crisis mode, things tend to get done. And so his idea of leadership was, I'm just gonna keep the organization in crisis mode because that seems to work pretty well, right? Which, which is true like for the first, you know, maybe few weeks, month or whatever. But over time, that continual stress People started leaving, people started getting burned out. It just, it wasn't a fun place to work at all. So that's why I say not reduce stress, but manage stress, okay? So there are times as an organization where as a leader, you need to walk into the room and say, okay, based on the temperature of this group, I need to reduce the stress level. And you need to figure out sort of how to do that. There are other times as a leader, you may have to raise the stress level. Now, I don't mean this is not permission for you to go back to your offices and start yelling at screaming at people, right? But this idea of sometimes people need to, it may be time for a difficult conversation. Maybe the team needs to understand that, hey, there's a reality here that I don't think you guys are seeing. Um, optimal stress, if I were to part, uh, draw you a graph of performance on the y-axis versus stress on the x-axis, it looks just like a bell curve, 
okay? So optimal performance doesn't occur when there is no stress. Optimal performance occurs sort of in that middle range. And just think about that, it makes sense, right? If, if we didn't have any stress in, my, in our life, we, we might not ever get up out of bed, right? If there's no stress to go to the job, if there's no stress to earn a living, right? We might just sit at home all day and we'd, we'd never accomplish anything. So uh, th there's some stress, that tension, that kind of causes us to want to, I want to get better, I want to improve, I want to do you know, things differently. It's actually highly functional. It's actually very useful stress. Um, one of the best ways I ever heard, or analogies I heard for sort of how you manage stress um, was from a guy by the name of Lieutenant Commander Rourke Denver. He's a Navy SEAL, spoke a couple years ago at one of our LeaderCast events. Um, but he told the story, and he was in that movie, uh, Act of Valor. Did you, anybody ever see that movie? Which, it was the, all the active Navy SEALs played parts in the movie. He was the, the Lieutenant Commander Rourke, I think was his, was his name in the movie. Uh, but he talked about uh, when he was going through as a lieutenant in the Navy SEALs, going through what they call Bud S training, which is sort of the, the, the SEAL training. You've seen the pictures of the guys running with, the, with the, the rubber boats over their heads and the logs and those kinds of things. And he goes, at the end of Bud S training, we were basically assigned a mission, and that was sort of the, you know, the pass-fail final for, for SEAL training, that we were assigned this mission that we had to go plan and do everything to accomplish on our own. And he goes, my team, this was graduation, right? And so my team, it was pretty obvious from the first that my team was not, uh, was not doing well at all, right? And what happened is the leaders in the team and the members of the team started to get sort of ramped up, and you could kind of tell there was that sky is falling mentality, the stress was going up, people were starting to snipe and yell at each other, and it just wasn't going well. And he said, there was this guy that was a master chief, and for those of you that know anything about sort of being in the Navy, you know, the master chief, those are like the sea daddies, those are the mentors of the group, these are the, that's about the highest level non-commissioned officer, and these are the guys that really kind of run the Navy, okay? Um, and this master chief, it was this guy, he was older, he'd been through Vietnam, he'd sort of been through all sorts of stuff in his life, and he's one of these big, burly, typical Navy SEAL kind of guys, tattooed up everywhere. And he called all the officers, he said, you guys, come over here, see with me, come with me for a minute. And so all these guys kind of sit down and they kneeled down around him, and he goes, I'm gonna tell you something that I learned from a master chief of mine when I was in Vietnam, um, and it's gonna change your life. And so these guys were sort of sitting there, you know, just waiting for this guy to say, and he goes, what you've got to remember is that in the military, and especially in the Navy SEALs, right, people are going to amplify what they see you doing, right? Because these are high performers. So if you do something well, you're, gonna, you're surrounded by high performers, they're gonna try and do it even better. If you do something poorly, it may amplify that. He goes, I'm gonna leave you with one phrase, and that is, calm is contagious. Calm is contagious. So if you hold your head in a crisis, those around you are much more likely to sort of echo or amplify that activity, okay? Likewise, you know, he says, stupid is contagious, all sorts of things are contagious. Optimism is contagious. All sorts of things as a leader are really contagious. And so when we talk about managing stress, you kind of always have to be making that, that calculation. Is, is it time to sort of increase the stress a little bit? Do I need to lower it? How do I kind of try and keep the team in that optimal, uh, optimal locale? I will also tell you, not every individual sits on the same point on the stress curve. If you're a, uh, you know, if you're a former fighter pilot, my guess would be, based on your training, you can handle a little more stress than the rest of us. You're probably gonna be wired to be a little more stress resistant than, you know, than I am. And so you kind of have to adjust that for, for individual people as well. But one of the most important things you can do as a master, as a true master executive, is to develop that skill to really manage stress appropriately uh, in your group. David? So one last comment about stress. Um, Part of the reason we're pretty passionate about that is we find that people, organizations tend to be really stressed when they're not growing, and then they're really stressed when they are growing. And my view is, you know, somewhere in here, life needs to happen, right? So as leaders, we've got to understand that, that component of how do we de-stress the organization appropriately. So if we all work together and, you know, you, you may not want to do this, but if you work for me, and last week we messed something up, there's two ways I can approach that meeting. I could walk in and I could sort of pound my fist on the desk and really get everybody pretty stressed about, I can't believe that happened, by gosh, heads are gonna roll, we've gotta fix, you know, I could really ramp the stress up if I want it. Back to Brent's statistic, I, can, I could literally watch the, the IQ begin to, to go down in the room because people, you literally see them start to contract 
uh, because of the stress. So that's one approach I can take. The other approach is I could actually come into the room and say, you know what, gang, we don't ever have to use our gifts at 100% every day to get through the day. We just don't. You know, at best, we're probably using 50% of our gifts on any given moment in any given day, right? But every once in a while, we get a gift. And that is that gift of we get to use our gifts at 100%. This is one of those moments. And so everybody knows we didn't do well last week, but I want everybody to lean in and I want you to turn your gift knob up on high and I'll bet we can solve this and fix this. I can assure you, version two of that gets way more result than coming in and slamming my fist on the table and stuff like that. Again, there's times to ramp up a little bit of stress, but most leaders forget that stress is not their only tool. So let's talk about uh, the next one here which is, thank you Brent, authenticity. So authenticity, um, it, I want you to think of it in this way, and that is that uh, we have this thing called transactional relationships and authentic relationships. I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands here, but I'll bet you most have heard this idea that when somebody leaves your organization, I've actually heard people say this, yeah, they're dead to me. Okay, I hate that term. I mean, I hate that term. I, I know what, I've seen that happen to people and, and I'm like, wow, what you're telling me is that person that worked for you for 10 years or five years or 30 years and they leave for whatever reason and, and now you're, not, you're gonna treat them differently. What you're telling me is during that entire time you had a transactional relationship. I'm gonna pay you, you do well, you leave, I'm gonna treat you differently. Authentic relationships aren't that. Authentic relationships look like, you know what, you, you, you want to leave for whatever reason, how can I help you be successful in the future? How can I actually pour into you, oh, you want to go work for so-and-so? Well, let me help you make sure you're really ready for that. I'll, I'll get you teed up for that. I can assure you, over a lifetime, managing and having authentic relationships will pay you dividends farther than you can ever imagine, right? Mainly because, and you'll have employees that go, I want to go back, right? Because I had an authentic relationship where I was. And so I just want to encourage you to really know what it means to have authentic relationships. You also have to be an authentic leader in terms of, uh, if you stand up and say, we're going to be th do things this way, yet you allow other things to happen. There's a great research project done a few years ago in, in England where there was a, a university and they had you know, a, lot of, a lot of land and they had this one area of land that was sort of private property and there was a fence around this private property. And the students learned they could cut through the gates on both sides and cut a few minutes off of their track to work or to, to class. And so some sociologists got together and said let's, let's see what impact we can make on behavior. So they put a sign up, said no trespassing, and they also put another sign up that says no chaining your bicycle to the fence. So two signs, because some of the kids were also chaining bicycles to the fence. So they put up two signs. Any guesses on what percentage drop they had just by putting up the two signs and number of people cutting across? Some said none. They actually had an 80% drop. 80% drop just by putting two signs up. Now, they actually reversed that, in other words, got back to almost everybody cutting across by doing one thing. They chained a bicycle to the fence. <laughs> so you have a sign, no trespassing, don't chain your bicycles to the fence, and there's a bicycle chained to the fence. So what does everybody come to the conclusion? Signs don't mean anything. That happens in organizations. We talk about, uh, we don't want anybody to behave like this, and then we let Susie, behave like that and nothing ever happens. That's the equivalent of chaining a bicycle to the fence. Now I will tell you for a while, I hope there's no Susie's in the room, but um, for a while people will be mad at Susie. Susie's bad, Susie did this, Susie's not getting along, Susie's, whatever Susie's issue is, for a while to be mad at Susie. But if nothing is ever done to Susie about Susie, never, but nobody ever has a critical conversation with Susie, guess who they blame next? Susie's boss, right? 
you're not doing anything. There's a bicycle chain to the fence and you're not doing anything about it. So I guess all the rah-rah you're telling me really doesn't mean anything. When we talk about authenticity, that means auth when you t speak as a leader and you say, this is who we're about as an organization, yet you look inside your organization. If you've got bicycles chained to the fence, I don't care how many posters you have around your business, um, those don't mean anything if you're not authentic in the way that you carry those things out. Okay, the next one is simple. So I told you I'm an engineer. Um, I used to like to make things complex, and I learned really quickly that the more simple something is, whether it's a design, a circuit, whatever, the more robust it is, okay? I've gotten to the point where I love simple. Complexity, if you think about it, is the enemy of just about everything you want to do in an organization. Complexity is the enemy of speed. Complexity is the enemy of execution. It's the enemy of clarity. It's the enemy of, you know, a sticky marketing message. It's just the, the, the more complex it is, the more the brain kind of shuts down. And we're wired to do that. The brain is wired that if we see something that we don't understand or that is way too complex, we go into lockup mode. So I told you earlier, I grew up where we never hired a repairman, right? The repairman, that was a sign of weakness to hire a repairman in the Douglas house. So I, I, I try and fix most of it. I haven't been able to hold my dad's standard. I will confess that. But I try to fix a lot of stuff where I can. So I had a leaky toilet the other day, right? Anybody ever replaced one of the little toilet flapper valves, right? It's this little, simple, stupid part. You go to Home Depot and Lowe's, it takes you like 30 seconds to replace it. So I go to Home Depot, I can't remember, it was Home Depot or Lowe's, and so I go to the plumbing aisle, right, to look for a toilet flapper valve. You know how many toilet flapper valves there are? <laughs> right? There were like 15 different versions of this simple little rubber thing, right? And I started looking, the engineer in me was like, well, what's different about this one and this one and this one? I, I stood in that aisle, no joke, for probably 25 minutes, <laughs> where I guarantee you the results would have been the same if I had just done you know, that kind of a number. Um, because my brain had gone into lockup when I saw so many choices, it was just, you know, I, I had to stop and understand them all. Uh, they've done studies, uh, Smuckers did a study, you know, Smuckers, the company that makes the jam, they did a study one time at a grocery store in cap. They took, uh, in two different experiments, took one in cap that they had four varieties of jam, and another in cap, they had 16 varieties of jam, or a different store. And they compared sales of jam, depending on whether you had four to pick from or 16. Guess the results. Four, by about two to one, right? By about two to one. People saw 16 jams, you know, I can't even, at our house, we can't even decide where to go eat for 30 minutes, right? So 16 jam, there's no way I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of uh, survive that decision. So simple, this idea of simple is very, very powerful. So the other thing I want you to think about as a leader is this idea of your, your job as a leader is to help guide behavior in an organization. So we talk all the time when we do strategy. You know, the whole purpose of strategy is people think it's about the plan, and, and that's important, don't get me wrong, but it's really about I need to guide behavior to a particular direction in the organization, right? We need to guide toward this way or this way or whatever. And so ultimately what you're trying to do as leaders is, is really guide the behavior in the organization and oftentimes change the behavior in the organization. Now change is really hard. And what happens is most of us think that all we need for change is just great motivation. And that's actually not the case. Um, there's lots of us in this room that know we should be working out, that we should be eating, you know, five helpings of fruits and vegetables, and we don't do it, right? We know that, so it's not knowledge. Some of us are even motivated by it. I went to the doctor, uh, had a little issue about uh, back in January, and um, uh, went to, had to go to a cardiologist, and let me tell you, that scared me to death. You know, I'm gonna be 50 in a couple months, and I was like, boy, I don't, I, I really, my motivation level was really high to get that fixed. And he looked at me and he said, Brent, you gotta be working out. You need to start working out five days a week. I want you on the treadmill, I want you doing something. And I'm one of those guys, I had always sort of tried to do that, and I could, you know, I'd do it for a couple days, but I could never get a rhythm going. I could never be successful. Well, I'm happy to report that I'm being very successful with it, and here's how I did it, right? So my motivation was fairly high to, to make a change, what I had to do was I had to make it s as simple as possible for me to work out. So I would get into this mode of, well, do I get on the elliptical? Do I get on the treadmill? Or, you know, what do I do, right? What, what's all this stuff? So I've got to the point that every morning now, or every night before, I lay out all my workout clothes, right? That's all laid out, ready for me to go. I don't have to think about, you know, let's gather all this stuff up. I've gotten to where I only do a treadmill workout. Now I'll expand later, but I kept it simple, so I've got a very simple routine. 
And that simple routine combined with the high motivation, that is actually what enabled me to sort of make that change and do that. And you guys are the same way. In fact, if you look at uh, you know, motivation versus simplicity, if you don't have a high level of motivation, something's gonna have to be really, really, really simple for you to do it, right? It has to be really simple for you to do it. You combine those two together, you make something simple, whether it's a marketing message, a plan, whatever, you make it simple, and the organization is much more likely to, uh, uh, to, to follow and to, to institute that behavior change. All right, David? All right, leading up, I asked Brent when, we, when he found this picture, I said, you know, because I've talked to people before about old shows, and I realized I met somebody recently who didn't know who Gilligan was. And so, <laughs> so when I saw this, I go, do you think they know who Batman is? And I'm like, trust me, they know who Batman and Robin is. But that's the old version. The reason I want to talk about that is the role of Robin. Robin was a great right-hand person. As I look back through my career, you know how you get smarter looking backwards than you do forward? So as I look backwards through my career, and I had a wonderful career at a great company called Ditchwich, and uh, uh, lo and behold, actually, trust me, it was as big a shock to me as it probably will be to you when I say it, but by age 38, I got to be CEO of Ditchwich, all right? And, and looking back, I was like, huh, I wasn't the smartest guy in the room by a long shot, all right? Uh, didn't have the most talent, didn't have the most experience, any of those things. But looking back, what I realized a skill that I did have, I was a great right-hand person. I was a great right-hand person. And whoever I worked for, I really learned how do I make sure that I'm serving them well. Where that started for me was when I was about 23 and I had to go to work for, a, uh, they would send you out at Ditchwich to all these different places and you'd work on construction crews, basically learn the industry, learn the equipment, all that stuff. So I show up, age 23, fresh out of school, and I'm literally in my head, I'm like, I'm gonna be the best employee this company's ever seen. So I'm out there with this old crotchety contractor one time, machine breaks down, and I'm, and I'm standing there and go, I'm thinking to myself, watch this, this guy's gonna love me, all right? And so he's, he's working on the machine and he'd go, go get the screwdriver. And I would literally run to the truck. Now how many, job sites have you seen where somebody's running to the truck to get something, right? So I'd run, I'd go get a screwdriver, and I'd run back, and I'd hand it to him, and like a puppy bringing a bone back, right? I'm just, I'll bet he loves me now, right? And I'd run, get the hammer, and I'd come back, and finally, this goes on for about 20 minutes, and I finally I go to get a wrench, right? And I come back, and he takes that wrench, and he kind of whips around, and he goes, you know, this would be a whole lot easier if you would think ahead of me and have the tool there before I need it. And literally, I, was, I remember feeling so deflated because I'm thinking, he's thinking, this is the coolest employee I've ever seen, and he's thinking the exact opposite. But what I learned in that moment was, oh, it's my job to understand what my boss is doing and think ahead of them and try to have that ready. That's what great right-hand people do. Great right-hand people understand how to lead up in a way that they're taking monkeys off the shoulders of their bosses in a way that increases their capacity. And why is that important? Not to make their job easier, I want that boss focused on two primary things. One, the strategy of the department, of the organization, whatever it is. And number two, I've got to increase their capacity so they can serve me. So there's a little bit of greed in there, right? If the boss is ever too busy to kind of mentor me, take care of me, serve me, that doesn't end well for either one of us, right? So leading up is a great, great tool, um, and I, I could go on for two hours about the attributes of a great, what leading up looks like. So if, I would, if you were employees of mine, I will tell you a skill of great right-hand people, no whining. There's no whining. When you're 13, you can whine. Okay, but we're now adults and we're all getting paid, so I'm kind of like, you're getting paid to fake it now. And the reason I say that is when you, if you work for me and you walk in and you're whining about, we'll pick on Susie again, you're whining about Susie, all right, and then you leave, you don't take that problem with you. You've actually put a monkey on my back, and now I've got to sit and think about that. I've, I've thought for two days about stuff that somebody whined about, and they're off 
gallivanting around because they got it off their shoulders, right? And I'm the one wearing all of that weight. So there's a lot of attributes that you have to pick up as a, that are skills that can be taught. I'm always amazed how people think, oh, I'm so lucky I have a great right-hand person. I'm like, you need to have a whole team of right-hand people because if you have a whole team of people that know how to increase capacity of the person right above them, trust me, that organization runs faster, cleaner, with a lot less stress because everybody's has learned the, that art of leading up. All right. Okay, the last one. And by the way, is there a Susie over here? <laughs> okay, good, because I was going to you know, make sure we're not talking about you, Susie. We're not talking about you. Yeah. This idea of optimism, and I'm going to close on this one. This is the last one. Um, master executives are typically glass half full kind of people, okay? They look at problems, and the way they look at problems as, okay, there's a potential opportunity here for us to learn something and get better. They don't look at a problem and say, oh my gosh, sky is falling, what am I going to do? Probably the greatest optimistic story um, that I've ever heard about an organization is we're wired, especially me as an engineer, I'm wired to sort of look for problems in an organization. And I'm going to talk to you just real quickly in closing about an organization that did it differently. Um, and it was Feed the Children. Anybody from Feed the Children here today? Are they even still around? So this was back in the early 90s. A guy by the name of Jerry Sternen um, uh, got invited to the country of Vietnam to work with them on their childhood malnutrition problem. So this was like 91 or 92. Um, so it was, you know, 20 years after the Vietnam War. Relations were starting to thaw just a little bit. And Vietnam, whatever their issue was, they had something like two to five million children dying each year because they were malnourished. And so Feed the Children, Jerry Sternen, had developed a relationship with the interior ministry uh, there, the interior minister that had invited him over to sort of work on that problem. So Jerry moves his family, goes to Vietnam, shows up, and what he finds is the interior minister wanted him over there, but none of the other uh, representatives of the government really wanted him there. And so they, they kind of hit a, uh, the interior minister started negotiating, and basically they told him, you got six months to make an impact. If you don't make an impact, you're out of here, okay? Now, six months, when you think about childhood malnutrition and the problems, right, that caused that, right, you're talking about all sorts of socioeconomic things, you're talking about infrastructure on, you know, sewer, all sorts of things come into play. And there's no way you're going to move the needle on that in six months, right? He approached the problem a different way. And what he did was he asked the question, where in Vietnam should we be seeing kids that are malnourished, but we're not? So where should we be seeing malnourished kids, but we're not? And so what he started looking, he called them bright spots. Let's start looking for those bright spots, right? Where do we think something shouldn't work, but it actually is? And so they found actually several small villages um, that childhood malnutrition was not nearly the issue that it was in other large ones, right? And so then, in six months, they said, let's go, let's go start studying those. So they put people in those villages, and they found out, and the idea back to simplicity, they found that it was very simple. Those families that were in those villages, they did three things differently. Um, the first thing they did differently is the traditional, uh, you know, meal time uh, in Vietnam, traditionally you had two meals. These families had three meals a day, right? And so what they found was, um, for, for malnourished kids, it's better for kids to eat more, uh, you know, at different times, although maybe smaller portions, right? So when you, when you factor that in into two, two meal times as opposed to three, they don't, they don't absorb the nutrition as well. Um, the second thing they found was that the parents of those kids in those villages were more intentional about making sure the smaller children got the portion. Because the culture was, we're just going to set the food out on the table and, you know, the kids just dive in and whoever gets it gets, gets what, right? And so the little kids were being left out. And then the third thing they found was there were some local shrimp that would grow in the rice paddies that these families were supplementing the diet with those local shrimp. And so those three things, and if they started looking at those three things, they decided, well, this is something we could train others on, right? This is not that hard to sort of, to sort of get across and do that. And so they started focusing on let's sort of take these techniques and let's teach these other, other villages and these other families in other villages how to do that. And within six months, they had seen a noticeable improvement in malnourishment, right? And so the government of Vietnam said, okay, you've proven it to us, you can stay. They ended up staying for several years. Uh, estimates are they saved the lives of millions and millions of kids just because they approached the problem of looking, you know, what, what shouldn't be working, it is. And so master executives, look for those bright spots in your organization. If you think the culture's bad, look for, look for managers that are doing it right. Look for bright spots and go figure out, go study those folks and see what they're doing. 
um, because there is, you know, you don't have to view those problems as just overwhelming. If you look for bright spots, that's going to be great. So speaking of bright spots, um, you guys have been a bright spot for us today. Thank you so much for letting us come and talk to you today, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.